Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Barcelona is one of the most beautiful cities that I've uh, visited in. And um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the... Can you hear me well enough with this, all this? So maybe we can change the light. So my lab uh, tradition has been working and has been studying um, uh, visual cognition. I'll just get a pointer here. And it's basically, as you all know, the problem of how the brain and how we understand the visual world around us. Yeah, it's really they're good. Working. If yeah, they're working on it, good. OK, so how we understand the world around us, how we can interact with the environment, how can we enjoy our lives, uh, uh, survive, and do all kind of things that, that we need to do as humans. And the, the human visual system has some impressive uh, capabilities. For example, how it is able to cope with uh, the presence of noise, a low signal, and missing elements, and still we're able to, to extract what's important there for us. Um, there are some, you can see that this is an old slide just by the picture of this phone here. But uh, nevertheless, I think it's pretty interesting how we can look at these two objects that, um, that look uh, very much the same, but we know that they are different objects. I don't know if people still know this. I mean, by now, both of them are combined into a much smaller. Uh, uh, but at the same time, these two uh, phones here uh, look uh, dramatically different, and nevertheless, uh, we know that they serve the same <coughs> function. And overall, our ability to extract uh, from just uh, you know binary, the very very uh, uh, low information uh, image, such deep associations, memories, feelings, meaning, and especially today, it's a 9/11, by the way, so that's a, a pretty fit uh, picture for today. And so, so the, the human visual uh, system uh, is amazing to many of us. And specifically, we've been uh, working recently for the last few years on the issue of predictions, on how uh, the brain is able to um, look at things and, and think about what's next. Kind of uh, imagine the next step, the next uh, few seconds, the next few, uh, where well, the timeline is different. But the, our ability to, to not just wait there, but rather think about the next step, anticipate our actions and the environment's uh, a, a behavior before it happens. And I'll start talking about this by introducing what I call the two uh, textbook myths in connecting uh, brain to, cogn to cognition. So these are myths that are kind of implicit in textbooks, but uh, they are there. And if you take seriously your textbooks, which you should, there are some things that, that uh, um, that arise from there that are not necessarily uh, in line with how uh, reality works. So one of them is that the brain is a reactive organ. And I understand that, that uh, yesterday there was a, uh, Giovanni talked about this a little bit. But uh, even if nobody says it explicitly, when you, when you look at, at, uh, at uh, any textbook, and that's, this, is a recent te this is a recent textbook, you look and you see all these arrows go in one direction, go from primary cortex go upwards in, in a unidirection manner, even though we've, we've known for decades that this anatomy is reciprocal. Uh, all these connections go in both directions. But this idea of, of uh, bidirectionality hasn't found its way into mainstream um, <coughs> thinking about how the brain works. So generally, you get the feeling that the brain is just sitting there and waiting to be activated by the senses, and only then it starts uh, uh, turning its wheels, which we know it's not the case. And uh, really, when you look at a picture like this, it's hard to, to stop your memory and your kind of extrapolation from taking uh, place and really thinking about uh, uh, how Paul is going to look in the afternoon today if he goes swimming. Um, so uh, so it's, really, it's really hard not to, not to uh, think about the future because it's such an inherent uh, um, tendency of our brains. And the second so-called myth is that, and you know, we've been doing this, or the whole community of, of visual recognition has been doing uh, this. So it's not uh, that when I say myth, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that was a, a natural tendency of how we thought about the brain. But I think it's, it's, we're ready to, to modify uh, this perspective. So the idea here is that uh, all of us who have been studying recognition for decades have been thinking about the problem of recognition as a problem of looking at an object and asking, what, it, what is this? Just analyzing its elements, analyzing its, its features, uh, texture, colors, curvatures, contour, 
uh, elements and, and, and come up with a meaning, come up with a name of what uh, this object is. And I think but with a small semantic, uh, seems like a small semantic change, uh, it actually is a profound difference in how to look at the mechanisms that underlie visual recognition. And we really think that what the brain does instead of analyzing everything from scratch is asking when you, we see, when we encounter facing a new object, we ask ourselves, what is this like? What is this like something that we already know? How can we connect it to something in memory, generate this an analogy between what, what's in front of us and what's already in our memory? Trying to find a link as quickly as possible uh, in order to give this thing a meaning. So uh, we really think about uh, recognition as an analogical mapping of what is this like. Well, what do we mean analogical here? Like really literally analogical, like that has to be sort of pipe-like, anything that is really, really it's more fun. So uh, analogy in terms of what, what is uh, in our memory looks close enough to this. Yeah, but your memory could have decomposed this, for instance, around what you can do with it, like the, for different affordances. Mm -hmm. And then you say it's like a baseball bat because you can hit things with it. So, so where is the boundary now of an analogical right. in this case? Well, so it's not, it's not you know, metaphors, it's really like, um, what's the closest to it? So you can say it's like a baseball bat, or you can use this to, to hold your papers on, on, on the desk. But uh, what, I, what I mean here is, what is this like close to? It could be visual similarity, it could be an event. So these things can be, uh, this is, I'm just talking here about the problem of object recognition, but I think even if you go to a cocktail party today and with people that you don't know or in a place that you haven't been to, you still take a cocktail party memory from, from what you've experienced and you say, okay, it's like other cocktail parties I've been to. So you can, it can help you prepare, it can help you understand what to expect. So uh, it can go to events and, and into more complicated uh, entities than, than individual objects. So basically we put this in a, in a, in a, in a very simple uh, uh, framework that all, all of its elements have been, has, have been studied already before uh, extensively, the issue of analogy, associations and predictions. We just put it here together to emphasize or to put in one framework how we look at these things. So when we look at a new input, and every input is novel in some sense because we, we never see things under exactly the same conditions. So even if it's uh, uh, something that's highly familiar, it still is encountered in, in slightly different conditions. So we looked at the novel input and we find the analogy. What is this like that we are already experienced? And you think about you know, how often does it happen when you see that you see something that's completely, completely novel, that, that you have absolutely no uh, um, um, analogy to map it to. Right, so the, the iPhone 5 is coming out tomorrow. We know it's going to look somewhat like the iPhone 4. <laughs> we know so it's, it's going to look like something that we're already familiar. How often in our lives, so babies always see th things as new until, until uh, they understand the world to some extent. But for us in our everyday life, it's, it's, it's a little sad, right? I mean, how often do we see something that's st so, so stunningly novel? That, that's rare. So we find this analogy between input and something in memory, and the moment we, we make this analogical mapping, we immediately gain access to all these associations because this has been stored in our memory based on experience, and it's been experienced with other items and other events and other occurrences. And by activating these associations that connect to the analogical representation we connected to uh, in memory, we activate predictions. So we, need, we, see, we, need, we see a new desk chair, we connected it to an old desk chair in memory, which immediately allows us to activate all the other things that come with desk chair, like a desktop and a computer, etc. So these are uh, 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 predictions that are uh, triggered by, by this analogy. So I'll start showing some data that uh, in the first experiment here, a set of experiments, we just uh, looked at objects and tried to, uh, uh, to characterize what happens in the brain when people recognize objects, individual objects. And that was uh, 2000, and, uh, and back then it was a relatively new topic. Now uh, we know a lot about this, but just to give you some, some familiarity with our methods and, and a kind of to build a story. So in this basic type of experiment, we, we've been showing ex uh, pictures, line drawings of real world objects. They were presented very quickly and they were masked. 
Uh, so the result is that it was very hard for people to, uh, act to, to understand what they're seeing, and it took several times based on what something that we call subliminal visual priming. Gradually, they became uh, better and better at recognizing these objects. And in this experiment, this was an fMRI experiment, they were lying in a magnet and trying to understand uh, what they're seeing and responding one, two, three, four, depending on how well they understood what the object is. And I'm sure that many of you have seen already fMRI uh, uh, result, uh, findings uh, and also in this uh, type of displays, but just to be sure, that's, that's a picture of a real right hemisphere, that's a ventral uh, this is a temporal lobe, ventral view of the temporal lobe, that's the prefrontal cortex here. And what we do is we reconstruct this picture, this uh, hemisphere, the two hemispheres in this case, uh, the brain into uh, um, in a di digital form, which allows us to, then to present the brain in inflated form. The inflated form lets us see all, both the, uh, um, salsa, the, the salsa and the gyri. So what you see here is darker gray, used to be the foldings of the brain, and this way we can get information about things that happen also when we don't see them in this type of views. So, and as you know, in, in, in functional MRI and other types of imaging, subtraction is, is uh, one of the main methods. So what we see here is what happens in the brain in terms of activation when we compare successful object recognition, when people say, aha, I know what the object is, versus when they see the same objects but cannot recognize them because of this uh, extreme difficulty that we present the objects with. So what you see here is not really activation, it's more statistical values of how significant this difference is. Uh, so, uh, but, but you know, we tend to call it activation even though we have to keep in mind that it's not uh, direct activation. So what you see here is an average of all ex uh, the, the, the brains and all activations from all our subjects in this specific experiment and we find uh, that again by now it's, it's, uh, it's well characterized but uh, back then there was a couple of labs that, that uh, we did it uh, and, and show that activation that's proportional to recognition to, that seems to be responsible uh, for successful recognition is in the, in the fusiform uh, uh, gyrus and you see that Really, that's the first area, first cortical area that showed uh, increasing activation as, a, as or increasing fMRI signal as a function of recognition success. So the more people knew about the objects, the more they understood the, the identity of the object, the higher the activity was in this specific region of interest, in the fusiform, which interestingly wasn't the case in earlier areas. So when you look at a retinotopic area such as primary visual cortex V1 or V4, there was no relationship between performance, bef be between ability to recognize the object and uh, activation. So these areas are strictly perceptual, so to speak, so they're really just responding to the features regardless of whether uh, 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 the, the individual, the subject, recognized or didn't recognize the object. So fusiform was the first area that actually showed direct relationship with this conscious ability of uh, understanding what the object is. Does that specially overlap with the fusiform face area or is it completely separate? It's, uh, it's, it's bigger then, so it, in, it includes the fusiform face area, but it's, it, it's much bigger, yeah. So we look at, at faces as a spe special type of objects that you know, we become expert in, but it's still an object. Uh, and what's interesting here, back to the context of talking about predictions, is that in addition to this, I mean, you do study in visual perception and visual uh, uh, cognition, you expect activation in the visual cortex, and this is indeed visual cortex, but then we notice this persistent activation in the prefrontal cortex. Why would the prefrontal cortex that until then has been thought generally as this high-level executive uh, uh, big brother in the brain, why is it involved so directly in recognition? Why is it more active in, in, recogni in successful recognition? So this puzzled us and intrigued us and made us think about you know, how to explain this and how to follow up on this experiment. So uh, the reason this is active, the prefrontal active, is active, could be one of two main reasons. One is that the traditional view of how the, the brain works, the visual cortex works. So there is a picture that the input picture is presented to the uh, primary visual cortex and it's analyzed on the ventral pathway that's believed to, to analyze form. And, um, 
and gradually and systematically uh, all these features are being analyzed and once the, the anterior uh, uh, temporal lobe knows what the object is, it sends this information for, for to the prefrontal cortex and tells it it's an umbrella, now you go do whatever you want and maybe the prefrontal cortex guides us uh, to store this, to, to memorize, to uh, uh, reach to it, to run away from it. Uh, and so forth. But the prefrontal cortex involvement, according to this alternative explanation, is that it is uh, a post-recognition uh, operation. And you have to understand that MRI has a very poor uh, temporal resolution. It sees things in the resolution of seconds. So uh, uh, this activation that we saw in the prefrontal cortex could be early, it could be late. We couldn't tell. And, and I'll follow up in a second. The second alternative explanation, which uh, uh, excited us more, was Maybe, maybe the prefrontal activation reflects some direct involvement of the prefrontal cortex in the process of recognition. So it doesn't just wait there for uh, getting this information about the final outcome, but rather it's actively involved in helping us uh, uh, to get to the final um, uh, decision of what the object is. And the way we think this uh, might be is uh, using some coarse rudimentary information. So, Let's pretend that you are the prefrontal cortex now, and you see this image. Let's start with this image. You see this image, it's really easy to know what it is, right? It's a coarse representation, it's very blurred, but I think all of you see here an elephant, right? I thought it was a car. No, it's a giraffe, but I'm just, uh, I wanted to see if you're awake. <laughs> okay, but you see this, this is really poor representation. Those of you here, computer scientists, uh, know how much uh, uh, reduce and compress the original representation might be just to give us this blob. But you think about the, the problem of understanding what objects are, uh, very often it's, it's thought of as taking a model uh, and trying to fit it into or to trying to fit the input to, to the many models we have in memory so we know what tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of objects. Take a new object and match it with all this uh, and the library of objects will take a long time. So any, any, any type of information that can reduce this search space, that can reduce the effort to, to compare the input with, with uh, memory is much appreciated. So we look at this here and we know it's not a book, it's not a pen, it's not an elephant, it's not a, a TV, right? It could be one of a few things. Can you try to guess what this is? Those who haven't seen the, my papers or my talks before? It looks like the clock of the... <laughs> Only in Spain you get answers like this. <laughs> yeah, it's very creative. I see what you're saying, but I never received, uh, never got this response. Like a drill but or something. A drill or something, yeah. Airplane? Airplane? Yeah. No, <laughs> it's Superman. <laughs> okay, so. Um, so these are the, you know, some, some basic uh, uh, alternatives, maybe DALI, maybe one, two more things, but you know, instead of thinking that this thing is one of hundred thousands of possible objects, we reduce it down to five. So see how much something like this can uh, facilitate the process of recognizing, of re reaching uh, a conclusion about what the object might be. So maybe we can use this type of information to start guessing very early. So the visual world is, is, uh, is, uh, can be divided, you know, roughly, it's really a continuum, but we can look at low spatial frequencies of an image and high spatial frequencies. The low spatial frequencies convey these blobs, these big relations, these aspect ratios, but don't have information about the details. Whereas the high spatial frequencies convey information about the details, but uh, missing uh, uh, the big blobs. And we know from, from physiology, from 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, that this type of information arrives in the cortex or uh, arrives in the cortex earlier than this. Uh, we're not talking about hours earlier, but tens of milliseconds earlier could be enough to start some processes that facilitate the recognition. So we know that low spatial frequencies convey exactly the type of information I showed you before in this demonstration of uh, the drill and the giraffe. Uh, and we know it's sufficient for generating uh, some kind of guesses. So maybe um, uh, this top-down specific, uh, the second alternative I was talking about, could work like something like this. In addition to this uh, uh, systematic um, analysis of visual information on the ventral pathway that we know exists and, we, and, and it's important and it's, it's very efficient, but it's not fast enough, Maybe, uh, in addition, we have this quick projection, this bypass projection of 
low spatial frequencies directly from early cord uh, uh, visual areas directly to the prefrontal cortex. Don't ask me how yet, or don't, uh, we're not, this is just an idea at this point. And maybe somewhere in the prefrontal cortex, this can trigger uh, uh, the activation of these initial guesses, just the same way that we talked about the clock and about the drill. The same way here, the prefrontal cortex can uh, bring about the activation of just these early guesses of what the object might be, and send these guesses down to the uh, ventral pathway to facilitate and constrain this process so that it is concluded earlier. So instead of just relying on what we have in the systematic analysis, get, get some uh, quick initial guesses to guide this process to a faster conclusion. So to study whether this prefrontal activation was active early enough, uh, as I said before, the, resolution, the temporal resolution of MRI is not good enough, and we had to um, um, look for other modalities. And you probably heard about MEG already here. Andreas, did you tell them anything about MEG? No. So magnetoencephalography, in many respects, you can, you know, it's, it's similar to EEG in many, in, in the fact that it's more directly coupled with the, with the actual neuronal activity, just like uh, EEG, and not like MRI, which is more like the hemodynamic, the, the, the uh, flow of blood. So this is the physiological signal, and in this case, unlike EEG, MEG uh, measures the small magnetic field that's emi emitted from uh, firing neurons, and it's integrating uh, groups of neurons such that the, the signal is actually um, visible. You don't, of course, need to know anything about the technology here, other than it measures. Uh, we can run the experiment in a similar way, have subjects sit in there, it's just a different machine, but they sit there, they have a screen, they look at pictures, they can respond, they can tell us what they see, and we can try to make inferences from, um, from their, their responses and from their activations. So what you see here, now I took the two hemispheres and, put, and separated them. So that's the left hemisphere and that's the right hemisphere, prefrontal, temporal lobe. And uh, now I'm going to show you the MEG allows us, because of its better, uh, superior temporal resolution, it allows us to create little movies about uh, how the activation uh, propagates and develops in the brain during a certain subtraction, again, of recognized versus unrecognized. What happens in the brain is a function of time with recognition. And critically, that's, that's probably uh, maybe the most complicated experiment I ran, but the simplest in terms of question. We wanted to know if this activation that we found in the prefrontal cortex is act is develop develops before the fusiform gyrus. So if this area is actively involved in recognition, it has to develop before uh, the fusiform. Otherwise, if it comes after, it fits better the first model that I showed you that it's just post-recognition activation. So uh, you don't need to extract the, the answer yourself. You can, this is just uh, uh, as entertainment here. You can look at how it develops as a function of time. And the critical snapshots here uh, show us that the same area in the, in the prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, shows this differential activation earlier than uh, this activation shows up in the fusiform gyra, and you see the corresponding timelines here. So in terms of feasibility, this area is, po it is possible that this area is actively involved during the recognition because it shows this selectivity early enough. It doesn't prove this model that I showed you, but it's already in the right direction in the sense that it tells us uh, orbital frontal cortex knows already something about recognition before fusiform gyra. So maybe it's this, uh, top-down uh, guesses, predictions that it's been sending down. Now, we published many uh, uh, papers on the topic that has uh, uh, data that, if you, you're interested, you can read. I won't cover it all here, but, uh, you know, some phase log synchrony uh, 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 analysis between the different regions of interest uh, in, in accordance with this model that we've been talking about uh, support this notion, again, that uh, that it could be that there is a, a direct early projection to prefrontal cortex, as can be seen by this increased uh, synchrony between these areas, and then uh, back to the temporal cortex uh, a little later, but in a significant manner. Uh, would your data allow you to say something about the directionality of this interaction? So it's a good question, and in the, in the paper itself, either this or the one that came right after it, we did some causality testing because we had some assumptions about the directionality and we did something like Granger causality and other types of, 
of tests and it supports it. But you know, the, co these causality testings are not perfect, but according, I mean, at least, but the, the, the tools that exist uh, support this uh, notion also of directionality. Um, other predictions that stem from this uh, framework, uh, I'll, I'll just show you one more that we tested, which was that uh, if these predictions in the prefrontal cortex are elicited, are triggered by low spatial frequency, we have to find some sensitivity to low spatial frequencies in the, fuse, in the prefrontal cortex, which we indeed found both with MRI and with MEG. And that's beyond the, uh, the attempt to prove a certain model. This is interesting because Again, until then, there were just sporadic reports of visual sensitivity in the prefrontal cortex. Until then, uh, the, the community and everybody was thinking that visual information is limited to visual cortex, and this is just a different uh, uh, set of functions altogether. And the fact that we show here sensitivity to something as low as, in terms of complexity, as uh, spatial frequencies says something about uh, it's more global role and more global involvement in recognition. So that's just a small uh, summary of, of some of the demonstrations we've uh, provided about the involvement of the prefrontal cortex in recognition and its support of uh, our little model. And um, we did some follow-up studies to, uh, to try to understand how does this information, how does this low spatial frequency arrive at the prefrontal cortex and uh, one uh, hypothesis that we tested and, and uh, proved is, and I'm bringing it here not because of its major importance, just because of both tell you more about the visual system and also about the way we do our experiments. Uh, so there are two main pathways of visual information, the magnocellular and the parvocellular. There's also a third one that's less uh, relevant here, but uh, they have uh, different strength or different characteristics, the magnocellular and the parvocellular. And what I like about this design is that we, as half uh, psychophysicists, took what we know about these uh, anatomical uh, pathways and their characteristics and designed our, our, our stimuli to activate one type of cells versus another type of cells. So unlike physiologists who really have to drill and put electrodes there, we could say, okay, there's this literature about these pathways, we know what they're good at, one of them is sensitive to color, the other one is blind to color, one of them is better at low contrast, the other one is blind to low contrast. So let's design two types of stimuli, one that will uh, recruit the magnocellular and one that will recruit the parvocellular to a higher extent. And we found that the magnocellular that's indeed uh, in line with the, uh, uh, the notion of conveying low spatial frequency, uh, uh, activates the prefrontal cortex more. The parvo also activates it, just to a lesser extent. Yes, it's, it, you're right. It's, it's a difference. difference. It's what? The latency difference between magno and parvo cellar That's an excellent question, and I'm not sure uh, that I remember the answer. It would be interesting, right? Because the signal should arrive at primary support yeah. with the latency difference. I want, it sounds familiar. I think we published the answer, but I don't remember if it was... That doesn't matter. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, uh, that's exactly what you would expect, that Magno activates, right. because we do see, even when I showed you this picture of kids sitting in a car with, with high special frequencies, right? When I showed high versus yeah, low. Airplanes. I don't know. <laughs> so the high special frequencies, at the end, you do see the blow, you do understand what's there, and then, so you cannot even survive with only high frequencies, but, so it arrives in there. But here you actually see a nice uh, distinction between how the magno activates the more anterior parts, and parvo that has the details activates the more uh, uh, posterior uh, visual uh, cortex areas. Okay, so... Um, Another question yeah. for my understanding. Mm -hmm. You could also argue <coughs> that maybe there's no causal relationship and the frontal area gets rapidly activated through subcortical visual pathways. Mm -hmm. For, you could also think about, look, frontal, more decision-making oriented, so you able to prime this and say, look, somewhere out here there's something important going on, mm -hmm. somewhere out here in the visual field. Right. So this could be something that, that is coming in from a subcortical pathway. Mm -hmm. But can you exclude that? No, I actually support this because uh, I tried specifically not to say that the information that reaches um, the visual cortex uh, the prefrontal cortex directly from visual cortex because when you look at the anatomy, V1 is not connected directly mm -hmm. to uh, these areas in the prefrontal cortex. Okay. It, it is connected to a frontal eye field, FEF, but LGN does. Um, so there is actually subcortical connections okay. that go there. That's one thing to support what you're saying. The second is that 
Um, when you think why would such capability develop, evolve in our brains, I mean, it's, it's not that we need to, to recognize the chair 100 milliseconds earlier, it's not going to make a big difference. So I think it is originally there for survival, for, for you know, fight or flight and, and, and things like this. And once it's there, it, it is used also for everyday mundane uh, object recognition. So it is there for this, exactly for this signaling. Okay, everybody else is also uh, welcome to ask questions. No, no, I'm representing the whole, the whole okay. <laughs> they, they gave you their questions before? Exactly, yeah, <laughs> Good. So that's a summary of this model that uh, early visual slash subcortical uh, can send direct information, low spatial frequency, to generate these predictions that help the ventral visual pattern. Yes, good. Actually, when, um, if the information is sent to the other part of the, from the other part of the brain, it shouldn't be also there comparing to a lot of models or whatever. Like you said, it's sent there so that to have a course um, kind of previous information to help in the prediction. But there in the front part of the brain, there should be also <coughs> comparing the course image with something to provide the possible predictions. So what you're saying, I see what you're saying. So if there's low special frequency image, it also has to be compared with other low special frequency images to generate the predictions. Yeah. You're right, and indeed we're careful not to uh, be understood as saying that the prefrontal cortex has a replica of IT and has all these uh, representations of all the pictures, uh, all the images that we are familiar with. Uh, this is something that we're still studying, how it develops, this mapping of an input low special frequency image uh, to an output of predictions. We have a paper that's under review now that talks about how this type of representation in the prefrontal cortex allows for invariances, for example, because the same, uh, if it's a gun or a drill, it gives the same low spatial frequency. That's why we, so uh, both images will activate the same type of uh, predictions, for example. So that's a good question and it's still under investigation. Okay, so uh, there's another question there. I was asking, what, what about uh, um, when you uh, recognize the wrong object? So how the, syst the system is uh, reset for? So uh, so you, you have activation yeah, for, for a, a certain, uh, mm -hmm. uh, say, figure that you that's also an important concept. And that's, I think, uh, the basis of how humans and animals uh, learn. Because uh, there's this concept of error, of prediction error. So uh, it's not only about objects. The prefrontal cortex may generate predictions that, turn, that most of the time help us. But if you predict about things that you do not really know that well, or there are some surprises in the environment, then we, we believe that these areas receive an error signal back from sensory cortices, depending on what the predictions were about, that tells it, no, you're wrong. It wasn't um, an umbrella. It was actually. Uh, I don't know, something else, something new. So we learn this new, this new prediction. So, okay, next time when I see this image, I know it's either what I initially predicted or this new thing that I learned. So we update what we learn. And w when you're a baby, you see this low spectral frequency, you have no idea what, what this could be, right? So it's all a result of accumulating statistics with experience that allow us to um, fine tune our predictions. So I don't think we're expert in our predictions. And I think we're all familiar with instances in real world where we are so uh, sure of what's coming that we sometimes distort what we see. You're sure that you're about to hear such and such or that you're seeing such and such, that you're, uh, uh, you don't let the input confuse you and you just see what you expect to see. I, I have another question. I mean, I didn't yet really understand how specific you think these signals in OFC are. I mean, OFC is also part of the limbic system and so it will be doing like an emotional appraisal or maybe reward or kind of thing. Right. And couldn't it be the case that uh, it's more like some you know, context-dependent evaluation saying, well, this looks like an interesting stimulus, and maybe you want to take a closer look. And so there is a facilitatory, facilitatory signal then sent to the temporal cortex. Right. But the OFC as such doesn't deal with you know, really specific aspects of, of the object that's currently being dealt with. Well, so uh, specifics. Yeah, well, it's not. Sp First of all, we're, we're not making any strong claim about where these uh, alternative uh, interpretations are activated. In the OFC, or maybe the OFC sends a signal to um, IT, to the temporal cortex, telling it what guesses to activate. So that's like a lookup table. Uh, so we don't have information to say that really that these representations are stored in the OFC. 
about uh, your uh, previous uh, point, the OFC is indeed considered part of the limbic system and it's been shown to be uh, involved in reward and in effective evaluation. We have some papers, one that's, that's uh, in press now, that uh, makes this uh, cross, uh, not correlation, but uh, um, we believe that it's been active in reward and in uh, effective evaluation because of the same reason, about, of, of prediction. That in, in all these tasks, in all these uh, processes, we need to be able to predict. We need to be able to predict the outcome of a certain action. We have to predict a certain you know, uh, value of, a cert of, a, of an action or, or an item. So uh, we think that uh, OFC is better characterized as playing a role in predictions and the predictions are not domain specific, so you see it in anything, even if you, uh, you know, uh, uh, try to predict the value of that a cheesecake is going to give you a certain stock that you buy or anything about, about the future would activate this area. So there's an interesting and we kind of uh, um, orthogonalize a, a design where we did increased associate predictions and affective value and found that one is more uh, uh, responsible for OFC activation than the other, so it does both. If I can just ask a follow-up sure, question. Sure, yeah. So, so uh, I would then also uh, would uh, hypothesize that maybe OFC would also be facilitating other modalities. You know, so <coughs> if you would play the sounds that uh, match or non-match the visual yeah. objects, say, then, then OFC would maybe, you know, be connected also to higher order auditory cortex yeah. or something, or um, some of the sensory cortex. Or I, think, I think it's a, it's a very legitimate so prediction. So it's not something specific about visual processing. Right. As you, I'm sure you know, OFC is the, pretty the most polysensory area in the brain, and uh, maybe in this case we have we didn't look specifically, but I suspect we haven't seen much of other modality activations here, downstream activations. But it could very well be because of this narrow context of the experiment. People know that you know it's vision, and that's it. So if you show them a mushroom, they're not going to smell a mushroom now. But yeah. if they were in the forest, maybe it was. Okay, so uh, as you probably noticed, um, the way we studied objects and the community has been studying object recognition is in a pretty isolated, you know, w one object at a time, clearly uh, 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 segmented on the screen for subjects. But this is not how we see objects in the real world. We, the way we see objects is, uh, let me see if I can, is they are embedded in, in typical context. They come with Where's the mouse? Let's see. This mask is staying on rather long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know where my mouse That's is. Keyboard. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I will just close it. Just click the red. So no, I just connected the remote control so I can change. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, I so just. If you just close it, it will be fine. Anybody has jokes in the meantime? You can, you can ask what his objects are. Okay. So it's even worse. Oh, the remote works, yeah, nice. So uh, objects do not appear in isolation in our environment, but rather they are uh, embedded in, with other objects, with other items. And, um, and what's interesting about our environment is that we have these regularities, that things tend to happen with other things in a, in a pretty regular way. So a pillow would 99% of the time appear with, other, with, with, uh, with a bed, or uh, this beach umbrella would appear with a beach chair and with sand and, and with the actual water. So the brain takes into account these co-occurrences, the fact that these things tend to appear together and store them in a way that can, uh, be, co they, they can be co-activated later and be used as predictions. So uh, we did a lot of uh, studies on, on the analysis of context and the, 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 the co-activation of things that are contextually uh, related. And I'll just highlight a couple of findings here. Again, you can uh, find everything online if you're interested for some reason. So um, the main initial design for this first series of studies was to uh, look for objects that are highly associated with specific contexts. So these things uh, um, are consistently activating the same type of associations in the, across different subjects. So we call them strong contextual objects because uh, a, a, a roulette is associated with a casino and nothing else. And this is construction hat or village people. 
and uh, or you see the, the, uh, uh, a card and you think a certain thing is a bowling pin, etc. And we compare this with the objects that are e we're equally familiar with and they're equally common in our environment, but they're not as uh, uh, consistently diagnostic of specific contexts. So you can see a cherry in many different contexts, scissors in different contexts. So we call this the weak contextual objects. And we uh, try to see where we're where and how this type of information is activated and, and uh, represented and processed in the brain. So here I'm going to show you a different type of uh, view. So that's the medial view of, uh, of the brain. And, and again, the gray and the dark gray, you, and you understand the, the story here. So we find for this contextual activ activation, then what, what activation is elicited by objects that are highly contextual and that are likely to activate predictions, we found this medial network that includes, you of, of course don't have to remember these names, the parahippocampal cortex here that, that feeds into the, uh, the hippocampus. What we call here the retrospinal uh, complex, we call it complex because it uh, kind of includes several areas in this uh, medial parietal region. And in the prefrontal cortex, in the me medial prefrontal cortex. So just to orient you, the activation that we saw before for the object recognition, the recognition of individual objects were, was more around here. So here we see that for context and, and maybe uh, complete scenes, uh, this area is activated. So um, maybe uh, tell you some interesting story here that, that uh, I think is parallel to what Andreas asked before about OFC being uh, in affect. Uh, you see this a lot in science and especially in neuroscience where uh, there are different communities uh, that find activation in a certain area and they kind of claim that this area is responsible for the specific function that they were studying. So uh, there's a community that studies navigation and spatial processing and orientation and you see these uh, green dots here, they represent different papers, different publications of uh, um, of uh, activation in this area as response to spatial in, in response to spatial processing, and at the same time, there's a community that studies episodic memory, and they find activations also in the same area. So there's an overlap, and there, these communities don't necessarily talk with each other. And you see this significant amount of studies in both types of uh, of examinations, and you say, why would the same area, the same type uh, part of the parahippocampal cortex, be active both for spatial processing and for episodic memory? And we also activate uh, in context, we, in contextual associations, and our, our uh, um, interpretation of, of this kind of multiple communities activate the same area is that contextual association is the bridge both for, uh, for episodic memory. Episodic memory means memory of episodes, of events, of things that happen together, and this also involves relies on associations and context, and the same about navigation. In navigation, you also uh, 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 need to associate and to link different elements, and all of these uh, uh, link uh, are linked through this uh, uh, glue of associations and contextual processing. So, uh, how context is? Yeah. So, just following the same uh, logic of the argument, the the retrospinal cortex and the medial frontal cortex are part of the default mode network. Yeah, I'll get to it. So. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about the default network if I, if I have time. I mean, I'm talking here until you're telling me that uh, it's time to wrap up. Okay? So, um, how are these predictions uh, um, and, and context, we call it context frames, or these uh, frames of, of things that happen together, uh, 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 like the beach umbrella and the beach chair, for example, or the pillow and the bed, how they represented, uh, uh, we call it this memory structure context frame. And these context frames, uh, capture environmental regularities learned with experience, as we said before, identities of what objects appear with what, and sometimes even specify their relations, right? So, uh, so a computer appears on top of a table. It would be weird to see a table on top of a computer. So uh, 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 this uh, memory structure of a context frame represents uh, uh, these relations, these known relations from our environment. And the context frames are activated rapidly by preliminary information in the image, such as uh, uh, key objects or, or global features, uh, uh, these low spatial frequencies that I showed you. So um, they can be activated rapidly by uh, low spatial frequencies, uh, uh, the same way that I, said, I showed you with objects, with the giraffe and the, and the, and the drill. You can do the same thing, and other people have done this beautifully um, um, with complete scenes. So again, you can look at 
this very uh, deteriorated image, very low quality image, and initially you think, oh, this is rubbish, you, can, you can't understand what's going on here. But look at, at how impressive your brains are. You look at this picture that really looks like a mess, like random dots here. And I ask you, what do you think this collection of pixels is? It's a car, right? So look at how powerful it is. We hardly have any information here, and still we all know it's a car. We don't know what type of a car it is. We don't even know, well, we don't even know what the direction it goes. I mean, you may be in England, you may be in the US, so you can't really tell what the direction is. But uh, uh, um, you have enough information to survive, so to speak. You have enough information to get some global understanding of what you're seeing here. And when the, when the high special frequency information arrives a little later, you're able to make uh, uh, some more uh, inferences about the object. And uh, we played also with this uh, um, uh, the same gun and a hair dryer again that uh, that in a certain in a different context so that's like a bathroom here and and this looks like a hair dryer you put the same uh, collection of pixels in a, in a workshop environment and suddenly it looks more like a drill than a hair dryer because it doesn't make sense that a hair dryer would be in a workshop so your brain takes into account this makes sense these statistical regularities and what do we know from reality that that uh, to interpret the image so it's not that our perception here is perce or in general is affected only by the input information as you can as you can uh, see we're um, constantly applying what we know from our experience to interpret uh, what the input is so unlike what we th what we used to think that brain is uh, the brain is reactive and it just responds to what the input is we actually what we know and what we have uh, stored in memory during ex with experience is actively participating in our understanding of the of the visual uh, the, the, the world around us, and these context frames, just to conclude about this structure, facilitate object recognition by generating predictions. By uh, uh, um, we have to show that that the facilitation of recognition, is, that the activation of predictions, actually does something. Why would we generate predictions? if it doesn't uh, facilitate something. So we show here, I'll show you in a second that it does facilitate, but I saw there was a question there. Yeah, just uh, to clarify, are you suggesting that in this sense, uh, this act like a selective uh, uh, mechanism, so a selective attention mechanism? I'm suggesting that what is uh, selective attention? That, uh, uh, let's say the, the role of the um, OFC, for example, could be like a, uh, a selective attention, so that you focus on some uh, features of the uh, yeah. scene? You no, know, it's not what we're suggesting, but it's definitely that they are closely uh, uh, interlinked. So uh, as, as uh, either Paul or Andreas said here before, uh, it might direct you, this signal might direct you, there's something interesting there. And this, uh, the, 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 uh, the result of this might be allocating all the attention to this uh, interesting thing. But yeah, so... Um, so to show that the, these predictions play any role in anything, we have to show that they are indeed, in this context, activate, uh, improve recognition. So what we did here, that's a simple priming experiment, and you've probably heard about priming in general. So if I show you a chair once and I measure your reaction time, I show you the same chair again later, you, you understand it and you recognize it faster than before, just based on your experience. That's simple repetition priming. But what we show here is contextual priming. The fact that you see something that's related uh, I, I mean, you see one object, if you see something that's related to it later on, you're also able to recognize it faster. So what you see here is, uh, let's say, different types of objects or, con or subjects or conditions. And uh, half of the subjects saw this picture. I'm just giving you a certain example to make it, uh, it's very simple, but everything here is counterbalanced and there are many, many pictures in each condition. But just to emphasize what you're seeing here, uh, if, if a subject saw an uh, uh, a Xerox machine, let's say, and then he saw a cow. The cow is not related to the Xerox machine. They're, they take a certain amount of time to recognize this cow. <coughs> but if the subject saw a barn, a picture of a barn, and then later on saw a picture of a cow that's highly related in, contextually, they rec recognize it s significantly faster. And that's interesting because when you look at it, you think, you know, it's not the, with repetition priming, it's easy to think why recognizing the, sh the same chair the second time is faster. You activate exactly the same neurons or more or less the same neurons, same conditions. You can understand how you, ca you can capitalize on the first presentation to recognize faster in the second presentation. But here, there's no overlap whatsoever. The only way to explain this 
is that when you see something that's highly contextual, just seeing this activates all these associations, right? And by activating these associations, when you see this, you, your brain somehow activates also a picture of a cow. So when you see the cow, you activate it faster than, it's the same picture of a cow, but it, what's different between these subjects and this subject is what, um, what they saw before and, and whether this association was activated. So we see that the generation of predictions actually uh, results in better uh, 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 recognition. So, um, so our brain stores together and activates together associations depending on context and how uh, things happen in, in, in reality. So uh, we talk about associations as the building blocks of predictions, right? The prediction is generated by an association. If this is associated with this, by seeing this you activate the other thing, you brought it online and it's like, an like a prediction. So if generating predictions is a continuous, proactive, default operation of the brain, so the brain is always uh, busy generating predictions, right? That's why we call it the proactive brain. It's proactively trying uh, uh, to anticipate the future. So if the brain really uh, uh, continuously generates predictions and these predictions rely on, associ on associations, we have to show that uh, associative activation is a continuous default process of human thought. So that's just a simple uh, logical flow here is that predictions are always there and predictions rely on associations. So let's see if associative activation, now we know how associative activation looks in the brain, is it really always ongoing in the brain? And I'll show you in a second, there was a question there. In how far do you see this context as a prediction? Because often prediction is seen as a temporal prediction. So now <coughs> when we talk about context, it's more like the association, it's not a prediction in itself because it's at, at the same moment. Right, so, so there is a good um, element here, the element of time that I haven't talked about, and there are two types of, and I'm talking about this together, so it, there could be a temporal context, right? So uh, you hear, you expect boom at the end, right? So, so there's, a, I don't know if the demonstration worked, but I think uh, you got the idea. So there's a temporal, what to expect next. But also if you enter a kitchen and you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the refrigerator, you know there's an oven here somewhere, there's a sink somewhere. So your next eye movement at the end will get to there if you want to, to if you are looking for the sink. So in a way, this image is also next in time, right? The fact that they appear together doesn't mean that they happen together in your, in your brain, right? You kind of track them. But uh, more globally, there is an interesting uh, relationship between spatial associations and temporal associations. I won't be talking much about this here, but I can direct you to some work from our lab and from others that did even more uh, on, on temporal um, context. So there is, uh, we think they're both kind of basis for, for predictions. Yeah. And would you say that similar or the same brain region, so brain mechanisms are involved in both types of prediction? Well, there's partial, it's a boring answer, but it's a, it's, there's a partial overlap. We just talked last night about entorhinal cortex and the grid cells, so they seem to be uh, um, spe uh, specific for space. People used to talk before that about place cells in, in the hippocampus, now it's more in the entorhinal and some combination in the hippocampus. But other people show that the hippocampus is also sensitive to temporal cortex, to temporal context. Uh, um, so I think they're, they're related, strong, more related than, than we appreciate, but still not uh, identical uh, regions, yeah. The bottom line is that we don't know. <laughs> That's uh, the bottom line. Okay, so we want to show that associations are, are acti associ associative activation is something that's ongoing in the brain as a default activation. So as uh, Andreas mentioned before, uh, there's something called the default network. And those of you who are not uh, um, up to speed on the literature and cognitive neuroscience, I can tell you that this is one of the findings from the last 10, 15 years that's been really uh, on people's mind and really, uh, it's a mini revolution. We don't completely understand what's going on there, but it's very significant, very robust, and it's there, so uh, we need to explain this. And the idea here is that, um, as, I, as I told you before, uh, in fMRI or MEG or all these uh, methods, we compare 
uh, one condition versus the other. We tell the subject, uh, look at this picture, respond, versus uh, look at this picture and respond. And in between these blocks, or in between these trials, they're asked not to do anything, not to, just to wait and while we're preparing the next uh, block of pictures or, or whatever the experiment is. And the implicit assumption there was that uh, really they, they don't do anything. When we ask them not to do anything, that the brain goes dead until we activate it again with some new stimuli. But uh, much to our surprise, uh, we found that actually, I mean, the, the, the community, that the brain is extremely active when we're not uh, engaged in anything specific. So when we are asked to perform a certain task, the, the brain areas and the brain activation that we know is processing this specific uh, uh, task is active. But when we're just left alone, when we're just stuck in traffic and we're just mind wander, don't do anything that's uh, highly demanding, we still find that it is uh, 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 very active. And what's interesting is that it is very, very active. There's a big, big chunks of activation. And also that it's very uh, consistent across subjects, across experiments. So there is this network, uh, especially media, that's um, active uh, almost continuously and it does something. The brain won't waste so much activation, so much uh, metabolic energy on, on, on something that is just mind wandering. Just uh, think about uh, stuff that's useless. So those of you, some of you might have already noticed that uh, this activation and def default network highly um, overlap with, the, uh, with our contextual activation. So that's the default network. What happens in the brain where we're not doing anything demanding, we're just left to our own devices and we're just uh, uh, mind wandering or think about something uh, that's not a task specific. And you see how nicely it overlaps with the activation that we found for, for associations. Um, that's another depiction of this overlap. So really what the brain does with this default network, this default activation of you know, most of our, uh, uh, our waking hours uh, is active, really uh, recruits the same network that we saw as uh, being active for contextual associations, for predictions. So uh, this implies that uh, this default activation, what the brain does as, as by default is you know, this proactive aspect of doing, uh, generating association and predictions, you know, planning, thinking about the future. What's the, what's the EEG uh, correlate of this default network? What do you mean, what's the EEG correlate? Well, th this is all at the level of the bolt signal. Yeah. Right? So that means the slow dynamics, so the blood flow dynamics, you see this concentration right. of, of, of uh, oxygenation. Uh, so the question is, but is there a direct correlate at the, at the neural activity level that you would extract using EEG? Right. So, so what's, what's the overlap then? So you mean some some could be earlier than the, than the others? Instance, yeah, or yeah. Or might be more diffuse, or uh, mm -hmm. we don't know. Yeah, we don't know either. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Andreas last night said that you're doing a uh, uh, resting uh, activity yeah, we'll MEG. Mm -hmm. MEG, EEG. And, and well, what you see is basically that you, this is coupling of the power envelopes mm -hmm. of uh, alpha and beta and theta oscillations. In these areas? Yeah, yeah. and the yeah. other, I mean, they're more resting state networks. Mm -hmm. And you can reconstruct this, so to speak, also from energy. <coughs> sure, we should have this, uh, well, we don't do the resting. We have the, the context aspect with a paper that just came out last year, I think, in PNAS about um, the MEG <coughs> pattern of, of this contextual activation, but we didn't compare it with, with uh, default activation. Right, yeah, Tony. Um, so the in these experiments in the default network, do, you, do people, the subjects always have their eyes open? What happens when they, they try both? Yeah. And does it make no difference? Uh, usually when you're lying in the magnet, it's so dark that open, closed doesn't make a huge difference. But yes, there's some, in trying to explain this massive activation, people uh, try to uh, come up with theories of this endogenous versus exogenous oriented uh, or, or triggered thoughts. Is this something that, you know, in inner, uh, depending on stimulus or depending on inner thoughts or whatever. So they play with the open eyes and closed eyes. Uh, it doesn't make a, a huge difference. Well, what's puzzling is the massive activation in the visual area, but not in other sensory areas. Uh, that's not strictly visual areas. That's uh, mainly parahippocampal cortex and, and hippocampus. There's no real, 
but you can imagine that you know you're sitting in a car and you're just imagining something or closing your eyes uh, you can see images right so you, I, I won't be surprised if visual cortex is active uh, no, I, I don't. I don't want to be. Uh, no, visual scientists have been arrogant compared with other senses for so many decades. I don't want to to uh, to uh, continue this. But t telling you that you know the visual sense is more uh, dominant also in imagination, in the kind of when you imagine and plan, and, and it's more visual based. So I won't be surprised if visual cortex is more active. But um, but I can't really say for sure. So did you try to test whether? Uh Ongoing activation in the network somehow influences performance in the contextual priming or recognition task? Well, one, one type of activity is obviously ongoing and the other one is in your task. And so you could try to see whether also at the level of the bold, mm -hmm. you know, these um, slow fluctuations somehow bias uh, what the what well, happens then when you give your stimulus. There are a couple of interesting issues here that you're raising. One of them is that to show this, and, and for this people have to, to uh, hear more about uh, um, the techniques of, uh, involved in, in, in MRI, but I'm happy to, to try to do it briefly. So um, to discover this default network, what happened was that uh, people look at what happens in ex an experimental condition versus baseline, when people just look at the fixation. So. Uh, there's positive activation with MRI, which is the red versus the blue, right? So the, the red positive activation happens during the task, and then uh, they find negative activation during the, during the baseline, meaning that uh, they thought that um, this default network is negatively activated during condition and is more active during not doing anything. So people used to think about it as negative activation. We found that in our task, Actually, we activate the context network during the task itself. So it's the, the default network during the task itself. And this for us, if people understand the logic here, uh, was actually an elegant way of attributing a function to this network. Because people used to say, oh, there is all this default network activation during baseline. We have to figure out what it does. Right? We found a task that activates this. And it's not during baseline that it's active. It's active during the task itself, meaning that what we're doing cognitively that's the function of this area, or at least of this network, or at least part of it. And by showing that we activate rather than deactivate, we activate this network during the activation of associations, we say that it implies that the brain, really the default activity, really relies heavily on associ associative activation. And there was another interesting thing that you said, oh. Um, but so couldn't one make a prediction? I mean, directly using this line of thought. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, if, if you would do a region interest analysis, you would see the bolt spontaneously fluctuating up and down, right? Mm -hmm. And you could you know, try to see, for instance, whether, uh, you know, say, an, a pre-activation of the network facilitates the task-related performance then in your object recognition task. Right. That, so that's that what I was going I to get to how this. Well, this would work for the bolt, but I'm sure something would be going there with energy. You know, if you could look in a frequency specific right. way. I was also thinking behaviorally, following your advice, that your, your question here, your suggestion, that it could be interesting to uh, mm -hmm. find correlations between how vigorously active your default network is be before a task. And, and people did do some things, but in other contexts, in other, in other uh, type of experimental paradigms, to see relationship between activity in a default network and performance in a task that comes afterwards. And there are some modulations of these activations. For example, meditation affects this uh, depression. I'm not sure if I'll get to it. No, I was going to talk about it next, but I'm not sure if we. Uh, so depression or other psychiatric uh, conditions can affect how well, uh, how much this uh, area is active, uh, this network. But basically, what we showed here is that associative processing is an integral process of default activity in the proactive brain. And as we said before, predictions are relying on associations, and that's another way of uh, saying that the brain is continuously active with generating predictions. So uh, what time is it? I'm not sure if I want to make the transition to you talking about the... To 11, how much time do you need to finish up? Well, I'm not sure if also if it's uh, healthy to make a sharp turn to talk about mood and depression after we talked about context. Let's live dangerously, you know? What's that? Maybe you want to live dangerously? Yeah, sure, let's do it. <laughs> okay, so uh, change your <laughs> mindset now. And uh, 
we asked at some point, well, that wasn't exa exactly the, the chain of events, but uh, I'm just pretending here, that we asked what happens to people who have consistent problems in generating associ associations-based predictions. So, as I said, the brain and, and others have said, the brain is proactive in a sense that it generates predictions all the time. So even if you're not aware of it now, you have in your mind somewhere a prediction about the coffee that's waiting outside, the corridor, the bathrooms, the stairs, the street, your car, your house, your family. So all these things, you know they exist and they, 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 they uh, reside somewhere in your memory as, as anticipate, some form of anticipation. And the brain, what, part of the reason the brain does all these predictions is to, to be able to prepare for the future. And, and the fact is that if you cannot generate predictions, you cannot uh, uh, reduce uncertainty about the future, and it, it is persistent, you just continuously cannot generate predictions about the future, we suspected that it might uh, generate some level of anxiety uh, uh, about you know, not knowing what's coming next, and, and, uh, and uh, sustained anxiety can uh, very often result in depression and other, uh, especially mood disorder um, uh, conditions. So we predicted that uh, um, the problem with predictions could actually result in some psychiatric conditions, primarily uh, we're interested in depression. Now the real chain of events is that I read somewhere, oh, depressed people have problem understanding context and taking context into account, thinking about a broad context. And when I was thinking backward and trying to understand how would uh, uh, people in depression, how is the relation? Because, you know, we studied the co context and, and mapped the, the cortical network for it. And now I have to explain how, what's the relationship between depression and context. Uh, there was nothing in, in, uh, in my background that, that uh, made me want to work on, on a psychiatric disorder. But now when I read that uh, people in depression have problem with, uh, with context, I wanted to connect symptoms of depression with what we know about predictions about context. So the end result was this hypothesis that we cannot end, but intermediate result is that we came up with this hypothesis that says, and I'll explain it, unpack it, pack it a little in a second, that mood is directly linked to how associative or inhibited are our mental processes. So that's a link between mood and the type of, of the, the pattern of thinking. So not the content of thinking, but if people think broadly with, us, with broad associations, it improves mood, so to speak, and, and narrow thinking does the opposite uh, to mood. Uh, there is some circumstantial evidence, and, uh, and uh, we have more uh, that I haven't uh, incorporated into the talk here, but it starts from the fact that people in depression have a thinner, smaller hippocampus, and, and the whole medial temporal lobe is smaller in, in, uh, in depression. When, and the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe, again, is the area that we showed before is very active for, for uh, associations and predictions and the default network. So that's one circumstantial evidence uh, to support what this. What depression are we really talking about? Because you have at least two forms of depression, right? One that is, has also bipolar components. Uh, yeah, that's MDD. Also. That's called a major depression right. disorder. So, so you're talking yeah. about mild depression with cognitive therapy, or you're talking about major depression where pharmacological intervention only works? This is just depression. <laughs> Regardless of the therapy, you're asking here, is this depressed people uh, undergoing some CBT? Uh, so uh, these are the two main categories of, of depression. Well, you don't categorize a depression based on the therapy that they're undergoing. You, you categorize it based on symptoms. So you're right that there is bipolar and there is um, major depression. Even with major depression, you can uh, subcategorize them. But what you're saying here is, are they taking drugs or are they doing talk therapy? And that's not related. That's not. Uh, no, I was saying something. I was summarizing uh, a larger statement in a few words, which is basically in these two classes of depression, which I think we agree. Uh, so if you have the personality disorder components associated with it, then also those patients only respond well to pharmacological intervention, which would suggest there's not a substrate behind it. Then those that have mild depression, which respond very well to cognitive therapy, and often actually do not respond to pharmacological intervention. So yeah. there are suggestions in these two classes of symptoms might also map to another, let's say, underlying neural correlate of depression. So yeah. I was asking, if we now talk about morphological changes in depression, which of these classes of patients we would be looking at? So in this specific study, there's no separation between how well these patients uh, uh, respond to one type versus another, but, but I see what you're saying. It could be something uh, that's worth 
uh, following up. Uh, another collection of uh, uh, interesting data to consider is that that's the, the, context, the context network that, uh, that we showed before, right? The areas that are active for contextual associations and predictions, the default network. Uh, you see the, the gray matter reduction. So in, in addition to, to uh, the hippocampus, there's also reduction in, uh, in, uh, in cortical volume and thickness in the prefrontal area, the same uh, in a similar region here. And what's interesting is, I won't take you through the different stages of, of depression and what happens in their brain, just take you to the, the worst type of, pre, of, of depression that people are so resistant to anything that's available out there that they're willing to undergo a neurological, uh, a neurosurgery that uh, it's called DBS, deep brain stimulation. They open and it's pioneered by Helen Mayberg. Uh, and what they do there is to um, open the skull and implant an electrode in an area that's called BA25, subgenual uh, uh, nucleus. And this electrode is connected to a battery that's implanted in their chest and they just live like this from, from thereafter. And the reason I'm saying this, I mean, the, this depression is so severe that people under, uh, agree to undergo all these things just to feel uh, uh, better. And what's interesting is that you look at this area where they, they uh, stimulate with electrode and the areas that we activate with just associative activations, uh, it, it's very uh, striking how overlapping this activation uh, that's caused by DBS and by pictures. And part of what we're doing now, we talked about being uh, um, generating applications from our research. Part of what we're doing now is to see if we can emulate the effect of DBS. Of course, it's naive and it's very, not naive, but it's very early on very early in the process, but we're wondering if we could uh, bring about the same benefits to patients, and we're working with a lot of uh, depressed patients, um, just by showing them these pictures that we know activate the same area, and just doing it over and over in some strategic way that will help alleviate some of their symptoms without the surgery. But we're very far from, from uh, reporting anything about this. But more interesting is, or as interesting... Just a question. So I think what Paul was getting at was that millions of people are depressed and they're, they're helped with serotonin uptake inhibitors. And so the, you're dealing here with a very um, restricted subclass of people where the de depression can actually show up anatomically. And so, so it, I think it really needs for, for to be accurate, the class of patients you're dealing with needs to be qualified in some way. So, so the people that benefit from uh, fluoxetine and other type of SSRIs, a lack of serotonin that when, it, when it lasts for long enough brings about also structural changes. So I would uh, dare say that all people with depression, that's more than just a recent depression, but just a persisting depression, have structural differences, have structural modifications from the healthy brain, regardless of any type of depression. There are changes in the brain. So um, regardless of whether you benefit from uh, talk therapy or from SSRIs, your brain is different than the healthy brain. And the benefit of talk therapy or the benefit of SSRIs over time will change your brain, hopefully again to, be, to, to look normal, but all types of depression affect the brain structurally. Now, uh, uh, what helps the, the symptoms, whether it's uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or, or some kind of psychoanalysis, or, or SSRIs, or other types of pharmacological intervention, um, doesn't change the fact that the brain is, uh, is, uh, is changing with, with, uh, with uh, depression. Uh, of course, uh, ideally, in an ideal world where I have all these millions of depressed people come to my experiments, then I, I'll be able to subcategorize them because, you know, that's the problem of working with patients. They're, each one of them is different than the other, so you would like to finally subcategorize them. But for the time being, uh, uh, people work with you know, we try to be as selective as possible. Are these people that, that you know, are treated at all versus non-treated? First episode, non-first episode, family history, no family history. So there are different, uh, there are at least 20 dimensions along which you can categorize these patients. So if you want to look at individuals with different changes, then uh, uh, 
then it, it, you just need many more, more patients. But the, the bottom line is, I'm going in circles here, but the bottom line is that depression changes the brain for everybody, depending, independent of whether you need uh, uh, drugs to feel better or talk to feel better. In both cases, the brain, assuming the depression is a sustained, uh, is, a, is a persistent condition for the individual, their brain is structurally different. So, uh, so I don't see that that's like a big obstacle in, in, uh, in uh, moving forward here in that kind of understanding. But you're right that, that categorizing it further will be benefit us. So if I understand you right, you, uh, your hypothesis is that a weakening in this asso associative networks is somehow causally relevant for generating the changes seen in depression. But how do you actually exclude that it's just the other way around, that this is some sort of you know, n deficit, say, in neuromodulatory system uh, leading to depression, and as a secondary consequence, Associative networks are deteriorating because people don't practice using those networks. So the, uh, I mean, it's a head and egg thing, but chicken and egg, yeah. But uh, but it's it's um, I'm actually capitalizing on this that the fact that it's chicken and egg because most people to treat depression uh, look at the you know all my psychiatric psychiatry friends uh, they think about drugs they think maybe less so about uh, talk therapy but um, they look they look at the basic level, serotonin, right, molecules. We say um, this improvement in SSRIs uh, during SSRI, uh, due to SSRIs or to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or other methods uh, gradually improve also the high level symptoms, cognitive and, and affective uh, uh, um, um, symptoms. What we're doing as cognitive neuroscientists is forget about these molecules. I want to start from the top down and treat the symptoms. I say, if somebody thinks narrowly because they're in depression and they ruminate and they keep thinking about the same thought, and this brings about after two years, it changes their hippocampus and it changes their mood and it changes all these things and it changes their serotonin up reuptake. Uh, what I'm doing is, I'm not worried about the molecules now, it's more like a reference on the side and I'm always referring to it, but say, okay, let's see if I can open up the way they think. Mm -hmm. I can make their thought pattern more uh, associative, more broadly associative, more thinking about the future. There are demonstrations that people in depression have problem with foresight, for example. So rather than think about the molecules, think about the highest possible level and treat their, cogn their, their thinking pattern and make it broader, just open it up and see if this brings about mm -hmm. Uh, uh, improvements all the way down to serotonin. And by the way, just to add on this uh, structural uh, 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 issue, there, there are nice demonstrations. So you heard about neurogenesis, and we know it's a contradictory, not, 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 not controversial necessarily, and I, I, I'm actually intrigued by it, and I'm optimistic about its validity, but we know that the hippocampus of patients that undergo successful SSRI treatment or CBT treatment both cases, uh, uh, the hippocampus regains uh, volume, just like rats that are uh, being fed this uh, fluoxetine and, 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 uh, and their uh, hippocampus becomes bigger. So successful uh, uh, therapy, reg regardless of the method, uh, brings about similar structural uh, changes. So but wait, there's something I didn't understand now, because you were saying that I thought there we were pointing to, to figure B, they said, well, if I now use the same visual stimuli, then I know that impacting over the frontal cortex and related areas, then I might have a similar effect as the deep brain stimulation. Right? I thought this was the concept. Yeah. yeah? But, but oh, it's now, very far, but that's, no, that's a dream. Exactly. Yeah. But now, towards the end of summarizing the slide, you, you were more talking about, let's say, moving towards approaches as in the cognitive therapy in depression, where for the self monitoring is, is shown to be very effective. Have you asked you to self uh, not exactly. So what we're saying here is that what happens in this type of, uh, of, uh, of activation here, this broad associ associative context, so we can just show people pictures of cows and, exp and, and hope that they feel better because uh, they start thinking about their associations. Because if their brain lost the ability to generate broad association, you have to encourage it. It's like muscles that you want to, excuse the, the cliche, but you want to, pra to, to train until they regain this ability. So, we're thinking of all kind of okay. pa cognitive paradigms, even iPhone games that you know will make them, will make them make these links anew and and try to recruit this network uh, in a more and more uh, normal Not manner. So clear. That's great.
Okay. So uh, what we're saying is that well, that's a complete uh, hypothesis here. It's, 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 com it's completely hypothetical. But uh, if that's the medial temporal lobe, MTL, where hippocampus and parahippocampal cortex uh, work with these associations, the healthy brain uh, jumps from one thought to another. There is some coherence, and we have papers about the difference in coherence versus incoherence of associations but, or activations. But the, the healthy brain, uh, and there's a lot of similarity between just a healthy pattern of thought and just a healthy conversation around the table. You kind of, you keep changing topics, but they're related to each other. One thing, one association brings another. So you, you keep moving from one topic to another, from one concept to another. You don't get stuck in one unless you're solving a very specific problem, but overall your free-flowing uh, thought pattern is highly associative, is broad, but not too broad, right? Because otherwise we'll start with hallucinations like in schizophrenia. So there is some, uh, a big brother here that monitors the, the breath of these associations and we suspect that this is type of inhibition that comes from the prefrontal cortex, the middle prefrontal cortex that limits the extent of these associations. So these associations are broad but not too broad. We want to continue being creative and looking for exploring uh, uh, opportunities but but not go too far and at the same time not stay in the same place. And what we suspect happens in depression is that there is hyper inhibition. There is too much activation coming from here. And that's what led uh, Helen Mayberg to suspect uh, uh, this specific area, BA25, why she wanted to, uh, to uh, 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 stimulate there. And when I met with her, and she, she was still puzzled about this is an area that's overly active in patients in depression. And the result of successful deep brain stimulation is reducing the activation. And we think the reason is that they have too much inhibition. And this too much inhibition, inhibition uh, uh, restrict the, the, your thinking pattern to be more narrow, more uh, 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 ruminative. You kind of get stuck on the same thought, the same topic over and over and over. And grinding this might help you eventually lose some of the structures or some of the thickness in these areas that like to think broadly uh, with these associations. So that's the basic uh, um, uh, hypothesis of how it works. And um, there's a whole talk that I give about this. And then we show some more findings. But uh, we're on a way to, to you know, supporting and characterizing some of this. But there's uh, still some more, a lot of work uh, to be done there. OK, so back to uh, perception and cognition. And let me just conclude that uh, perception relies on existing knowledge as much as it does on incoming information. And I showed you how our, you know, the strength of our predictions can affect our perception. It can uh, modify the way we see the world because we take into account both the internal presentations as well as what's out there. And uh, a rapid first pass in the case of vision, low spatial frequencies, via analogies, answer the question of what is this like? Not just what is, this, what, what is this, but rather what is this like? And by answering this question, our proactive brain generates predictions that facilitate perception, cognition, and action. And I want to thank you and the different generations of my lab. Some of them are here. And thank you very much. Great, Moshe, thank you. Mm. Uh, time for some questions. So you, I was very interested in the way that you put the um, uh, the link between mood and uh, the link between mood um, and associativity, and I thought at the beginning that you were saying that the uh, associativity is an important process in prediction, and it's the failure of prediction accuracy that would influence mood. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I sort of lost the link there. It, it, towards the end, it was you were talking about the narrowness of association and that being directly linked uh, with mood. Is it the case that you that the link is prediction accuracy? And if that's the case, how, how does that? Uh, not accurate. I, I wasn't talking about prediction accuracy necessarily, but just the fact that, you, that your brain generates predictions and that it does think in a broadly associative manner rather than a very narrow manner, that's, that's what we see the link to mood. So the, the more narrow you think and the less <coughs> foresight no, a future oriented, the less, you know, the, the, the more negative the mood is, so to speak. So then my question would be, why would that be the case? Why would being narrowly associative lead to a lower mood? That's, that's a good question, and I can only speculate. There's no uh, uh, 
uh, good answers there. But you know, endorphins and, and kind of uh, using uh, uh, novel uh, activation uh, uh, pathways versus repeating the same the same uh, activation patterns. That's a good question. Why would narrow uh, uh, be associated with 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 negative mode? That's uh, that's a good question that we, I can only speculate on, <laughs> and I don't want to. Yeah. Right, you want Thank you for your talk. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, well, I would have many questions, but just one. So, uh, one question is: uh, uh, you discuss a, a lot of this uh, passage of uh, coarse-grained information to the orbitofrontal cortex, which is also, uh, as we already discussed, very, very, very well known also for affective processing and uh, the. The Reward. economic value of decisions, in a sense. So the, uh, the first part of the question is: Do, do you think that this evolutionary, this cost-grained information could be sufficient for this uh, economic, well, for those important decisions, and that could be uh, one reason for passing this information to the orbitofrontal cortex? So w w would that uh, low-resolution information would be sufficient at least to take some decisions that are related to survival? Yeah. Uh, we discussed this, as you said a little bit before. Um, I think it's no surprise that the predictions and the, and the predictive aspects of OFC activate uh, that they fall on such a limbic, uh, limbically associated. I don't know if anybody ever used it, like the limbically associated uh, structure as the OFC. Uh, I think you know evolution uh, guesses. All of you know we we all can <laughs> speculate as much as we want. So it does sound that uh, it does seem that it makes more sense that this ability to generate predictions quickly uh, has evolved in order to help us survive and help us uh, defend ourselves and, and get uh, our needs as quickly as possible. So uh, I won't be surprised if that's the, if that's the reason, even though I can't really uh, prove it. Uh, but as I said before, and there are demonstrations, even the, this blurred scene of a street that I showed you and all of you knew that it was a car, uh, shows you that um, the low special frequencies and the predictions that are uh, elicited by them are sufficient to help you decide on some you know, basic level uh, categorization how to respond to your environment. Um, yeah, I think that, that yeah, answers. So just, just the second part of the question was, was again, uh, uh, when talking about mood and depression, so I, I was a bit surprised that you, again, did not link also these two affective processes that happen to the same area. So do you think that also part of the depression is not only this, well, you discussed the rumination, the, let's say the contraction of, uh, <coughs> but also the contraction of the, uh, the affecting effective evaluation of the future states that could be also related to, to the feelings that you have during depression, so yeah. that's misguided. Well, it's an interesting link which uh, we haven't elaborated on, but uh, part of the reason I think is because I don't really believe that OFC is directly related to the to affect to how we feel, but I think it's related to the predictive aspects when we evaluate the affective value of something that's in front of us. So I don't think that uh, OFC is like amygdala or like other parts of the brain that are directly involved with emotion with affect, but rather uh, I think it carries the part of future consequences, like in reward estimate and the same, similar in affect and similar in other, you know, perception related predictions. So I think the, the common denominator in the OFC activation for all these processes is its predictive co uh, characteristic and not its, I don't think it's directly related to how we feel. Uh, I want to ask about your concept of these contextual frames. So if I understood you right, uh, your idea is the contextual means information about other stimuli and this information about emotional balance, mood and so forth. Uh, could you think of this also including information about action, like upcoming action, or even in the simplest case, you know, current movement context? So right. if I'm, you know, planning to say throw a ball, you know, whatever in a certain ball game, mm -hmm. that this might influence and, and strongly bias how I interpret the next upcoming stimulus. And related to that, uh, did you ever find any activity if you look into motor or premotor cortex? Uh. Yes, uh, the, the answer is yes to both, and not to motor, but we found that, so, so I agree with you completely that it, I, I mean, that's how we think about it. It's related to any type of predictions, and I don't, I don't see any reason to distinguish between predictions that have to do with objects that tend to appear to, uh, in the same scene versus uh, what's the next action. Uh, and we did have um, 
and we did find some activation in the dorsal pathway. So even though recognition, you know, you expect it to be ventral, but for this fast projection of low spatial frequencies, presumably by, by the magnocera pathway, uh, we found uh, some activation in the dorsal pathway. I have to admit we haven't zoomed enough on, on action and, and uh, motor uh, cortices, but uh, I, I'm willing to bet that it will be there. Yeah, so I can uh, guide you to where we found it. So, um, while I'm handing over the microphone to Nathan, it, you could argue that the first part of your talk and the second part are partially contradictory. Because really? in, in the, well. <laughs> really, I can argue this. So, um, <laughs> I will explain it to you. So, Please in the so. first part, we look very much at, at the issue of prediction in visual recognition. Mm -hmm. right? So, here we go to these frontal areas, mm -hmm. over the frontal cortex. We get, a, 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 let's say, a, a, a quick hint of what we could be looking at, and we're predicting back the details of something like this, mm -hmm. and then we can start to fill in more easily. So it's right. a very right. perception-oriented interpretation. In the second part, you look at the same area over the frontal cortex, purely in the context of mood, right? And, and there, your interpretation is more like, well, this, this network is sort of monitoring or it's sort of restricting an associative network. Mm -hmm. right? and, this, and this restriction of association is correlated in some way, we're not clear about the causality, to, to your mood, right? to your effective mm -hmm. well-being. Mm -hmm. In case of depression, it's more restricted, mm -hmm. and in case of sort of a normal existing happy human being, as yourself, mm -hmm. it's sort of more open. Mm -hmm. right? So, but these two interpretations of OFC might not sit together very well, because the mood component doesn't play any role, any, f any functional role in, in the first part of the, of the talk, where we just think about perception, so it's more like an information-oriented mm -hmm. system. Mood is completely irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? So, so how can you tie this together now? Well, it's a question that's related to the uh, gentleman's question over there about why would you say narrow uh, associative thinking, this rumination, why would it uh, result in, in negative mood? Well, not because only that. Why? because in, the, in the first part, mood is just not playing a role at all. Right. 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 And indeed, Helen's uh, Mayork's work shows that this area is actually very much involved in the case of depression uh -huh. in the regulation of mood. Mm -hmm. yeah, but in the first part, mood doesn't play affective state doesn't play any role. Right. Well, in the second part it does. It doesn't play a role in recognition necessarily, but uh, whether it's affected. Mm -hmm. We didn't, we didn't study, and if I took the very st first study, the, the, what, the 2001 study, it also measured these people's mood, the subject's mood, and found that uh, these that came into the experiment with a, more, in, with a better mood than the others showed more activations of predictions, were better in, uh, in, in, in predicting what the object might be. There might have been such a, such a correlation there. We just didn't, didn't check it. So that it doesn't play a role. I mean, it's not affecting recognition. There are some ex examples where, where mood can affect, uh, you know, if you see the, f the, the half full or half empty of the glass and things like this. So people, it does, mood does affect uh, attention, attention allocation, other uh, types of sensitivities. But independent of this, you're right that in those experiments, uh, I didn't talk about mood, but uh, if I correlated performance and, uh, and, and, uh, and starting mood of these patients, uh, these subjects, I won't be surprised if there was, uh, and, and we do do now experiments where we do this contextual priming, for example, the, the cow and the barn and all that, and the Xerox machine that I showed you before, and try to correlate with their mood before and after. So, so uh, it doesn't play a role, but it is affected, mm -hmm. and it is affecting, right. uh, yeah. Okay. So maybe one of the previous questions touched yeah, on this. Talk into the microphone, not okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so maybe one of the previous questions uh, sort of related to this. But you, you discussed about how uncertainty and the rumination was, if you like, symptoms of deficient decision making and depression. But you didn't mention anything about decision accuracy. And I was thinking that um, if you have a variable reaction time task, you may take longer to make up your mind, but your decisions could be uh, unaffected in their accuracy. But if you had fixed reaction time task instead, then maybe that uncertainty could cause um, deficient you know, decision accuracy as well. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if it answers completely your, your question, but uh, there are some intriguing findings that people in depression in certain tasks are actually better than healthy individuals. And it, it helped uh, 
coining this uh, half, uh, I don't know how to call this term, but there's this term called depressive realism that, uh, that it's all of us non-depressed that are delusional and the depressed see the world as it is. And it started with an interesting experiment where um, there was a, a light bulb on the, on the desk, there's a, like some kind of a, and there is a switch that you can turn it on and off. And uh, they brought into the lab uh, both healthy individuals and depressed people. And they had them toggle the switch on and off and on and off. And uh, sometimes the light will come on, sometimes it won't. It's, it wasn't always on when it switched on, so there's some probability or whatever. And uh, they asked subjects at the end of the experiment, how much control do you think you had on the light bulb with the switch? So the healthy individuals saw that they had like 75% control over the switch. And uh, the, the depressed people said, I had absolutely no control over the light bulb. This is, and in reality, they weren't even connected, the light bulb. And so, so the depressed <laughs> really saw that. And, and that's, that's uh, an amusing maybe a demonstration, but there are other demonstrations in working memory and in types of, uh, because you would expect, and there was actually a big uh, uh, New, York, uh, New York Times article a year or two ago that talked about <clears throat> the possible advantages of negative mood. Because if negative mood is, it makes you so narrowly uh, focused, maybe in some specific tasks. Uh, now, of course, I'm not saying that every time we do something that requires some attention, uh, you know, some focusing, we become depressed. But, uh, but if, you know, I think it's more the issue of timeline and, and persistence. So last question. So um, I had a question about the, the mood and the depression. Uh, so it's very interesting, and I think it's a very yeah. broad Good subject. thing we made uh, we <laughs> live dangerously, you <laughs> say. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering about uh, the f uh, if you have uh, done some studies about uh, meditation, uh, because it has been shown that meditation has very positive aspects uh, regarding depression, uh, yeah. especially when persons are anxious and so on. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had done some studies at the brain level uh, yeah. when of persons doing meditation, because it has been yeah. already shown that there are some particular activities in the brain that mm -hmm. goes on. I yeah, I have a lot to say about this. I mean, the, the beginning I was intrigued so much that I spent uh, eight weeks uh, in uh, taking a meditation, uh, mindfulness meditation, uh, in Boston, well, it was in the evenings and uh, once a week, eight weeks. So it was eight meetings, but still it was a lot. And it ended with a, with a very interesting retreat of a whole weekend of being silent and all this stuff. So that's interesting experiences, but I wanted to see what is it about uh, uh, mind wandering and about, it was before I was thinking about mood. I can tell you that my mood was very negative initially when you just lie down and you think about your toes or anything that's very focused. This, this can drive you crazy and, and uh, quieting your mind is not as uh, romantic as it sounds, <laughs> at least the beginning, until you master more of the, of the methods. But uh, more specifically, in some cases, uh, meditation is prescribed for, for patients to, to kind of as a, as a remedy for depression. And there was, uh, I can share with you some process, some uh, thinking process I've been going through with this because I have uh, quite a few friends that are intense meditators and none of them is somebody who's giddy, you know, like always laughing and jumping in the corridors. They're all, they're almost emotionless in their face, expressionless. They're not depressed, but they're not also extremely happy. So, uh, so I think, no, but this, this brought about, at least in my mind, an interesting hypothesis that I would like to pursue because I always thought, and in our attempts to, to alleviate some of the symptoms in depression, I thought that mood is, is one scale, it goes from very negative to very positive, right? And I, it was a mystery for me because if you take somebody and you give them two martinis, they're much happier than somebody who just meditated for, for two months. So uh, the idea here is that um, so what, what this kind of, you know, it's, it, you're laughing and it sounds like a joke, but it, there's an interesting issue here. Is it really that uh, uh, you do meditation, you do meditation until you become uh, very happy? And not only this, there's something that's uh, contradictory to our theories in meditation because meditation doesn't encourage people to associate broadly. If anything, they focus, initially they focus, you know, the, the method I, I studied had this body scan method, it's very technical, but it, it is focusing you. And, and it, it's also funny, as a scientist, you sit in these sessions, the first session, they talked about diffused attention. 
And for me, it sounded like, like an oxymoron. What do you mean diffuse attention? Attention is focusing. What do you mean diffuse? But gradually, you understand what they mean. And it's beautifully uh, powerful because they really attend, you know, they spread their attentional focus on the entire scene. So, so becoming more attentive of everything. So I don't know if there's a zero-sum game. And when you attend everything, maybe you attend less each pixel. But, uh, but um, it's very interesting. And maybe there is some broad thinking there. But I don't think so. I think that it, it makes you uh, uh, more focused overall. And then I, th I was thinking, you know, how could something that focuses you makes you uh, happier if my method, is, my, my hypothesis is that you actually don't want to focus, you, you want to be uh, happily distracted. So uh, this again brought about this notion, or in my mind it's hypothetical, that mood doesn't go from very negative to very positive, it's not one axis. Then I started thinking about mood, uh, I can't write here, but it, it'd be uh, from very negative to zero, to neutral, all my meditator friends are zero. They're, 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 they're at, at, uh, I don't want to offend also anybody who's doing meditation. I'm just saying that it, it puts you, it makes you balanced. You know, you're not delusional and you're not depressed. And from going from zero to, to plus, so being very positive might require different methods and might require different, might recruit different modalities or different uh, brain structures. So making you from depressed, taking you from being depressed to non-depressed is requires one set of tools and one set of applications. And taking you from zero, from being neutral to being really happy and giddy is different brain structures and different methods. So it's not that if I try hard enough, I take somebody depressed and I make them very happy, we have to go through this zero point and then might require uh, different, different methods. So, um, so I think that, the, the, that, that meditation helps you get rid of this rumination. So the problem with, with depressed, uh, being ruminating and thinking about the same topic over and over and over, they need somebody to, boom, give them a little hit there and make them uh, detach and stop thinking about this thing. I, I think and it's the, to lower the inhibition. inhibition. Right it, could, it could be, but I think more directly it resets your thinking pattern. You have a little cache memory there that's busy thinking about the bad remark that you made last night and you keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it. You need something to distract you. So meditation helps you not dwell on things. So in that regard it helps depression because it, get, it gets rid of the rumination. But it doesn't uh, uh, you know, change the content of this cache memory in your thinking pattern with positive thoughts necessarily. Anyway, I've been talking too so much. On that, Thanks. On that note, we thank our speaker. Thank you very much.